On behalf of the Arizona Small Business Association and Journeyage, welcome to Arizona Speaks, what you need to know about elections in Arizona. Thank you all for joining us today, though we are not together in person, we are really grateful for the opportunity to gather virtually. ASBA has an amazing event planned for today, and I certainly can't wait to get started and delve into Arizona's voting system in advance of the upcoming and important 2022 primary and general elections. My name is Jonathan Cottrell. I'm the Chief Executive Wayfinder of Journeyage. Journeyage is proud to partner with the Arizona Small Business Association and the small business community at large. Journeyage, we know just how important a constant journey of learning is, and that's exactly what we're here to do today, learn together. We believe developing a culture of continuous learning is a bedrock to building an organization that is constantly improving and growing. And that's why we've partnered with ASBA to create irreplaceable training and personalized learning experiences for small business owners, employees, and patrons all across the state. Today's event is one such example, offering you and others a unique opportunity to learn more about a critical topic for strategically maximizing your business's potential for success, voting and elections in Arizona. Without further ado, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Jen Daniels. Please join me in welcoming her and kicking off today's important event. Good morning, everyone. So glad to be with you. I wish I could see all of your faces today. Um, I am sad that we're still not face to face, but certainly appreciate everyone's participation today. And I'm really excited about this topic. Um, it's been such a focus of both state and national attention uh, as it relates to Arizona elections. And I think we all have so much to learn in this space and have just the right individual to help us do that. Uh, we really do want to thank our program sponsors, SRP, Cox, Business, um, Journeyage, SHRM, GP, APS, and Southwest Airlines. Um, great, we can't do this without sponsors, so thank you to all of those different groups and for their consistency in finding value in communicating and working with us over at ASBA. Um, I also wanted to take a quick moment to recognize ASBA's organizers, uh, the people who are behind the scenes and work so hard to make this happen, Debbie Han, Genesis, Emma, Robin, and, and Ryan. You guys are fantastic and, and always doing so much work on behalf of small business, businesses in Arizona, and we're so grateful. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all today, Stephen Richer. I have a super fun, we called it the Fund Up bio. Um, I hear a lot of biographies of people when we're doing different events, so all around. Um, some of them are, are um, a little sleepy and they make people's lives sound far more boring than they actually are. I hate it when someone reads my bio because it sounds like all I do is sit in a meeting. But Stephen, Stephen Richer has been our county recorder, Maricopa County recorder, um, was elected in November of 2020 and took office in January of 2021. Uh, so he is uh, in elected office now and doing great work on our behalf. Um, here's what you need to know. I am, um, uh, he is one of us, uh, meaning that he has been a small business owner for many, many years. He's owned or co-owned several businesses, including a bar, an iPhone app, an online calendaring service, a frozen yogurt store, and most of them, in his own words, were not very successful, but they were terribly fun with the exception of the bar. That was not a fun business to own, it, it, it sounds like. Um, he is now involved in a heavy machinery distribution business, so we'll want to hear probably a little bit more about your business background, too. He's also a lawyer and went to law school in Chicago, where he also met his wife. Um, uh, and it, he met her at a Halloween party, uh, so we'll have to find out um, what you guys were dressed up as and if that was really like what, what brought you two together. I've always like, you know, it's like a movie scene when you match with somebody, uh, you both, one, one of you showed up as ketchup and one of you showed up as mustard or something, and then you knew. Um, I'm not sure if it was like that, but we'll find out. Uh, Stephen has um, really done a remarkable job navigating a very complex topic in Arizona over the last several years. And I wanna make sure that all of the attendees understand that this is, not a partisan conversation. It's really important for us to know that um, 
businesses come from all different backgrounds, business owners. Um, this is not a partisan conversation at all. This is truly about voting, how to vote, when to vote, um, all of the, the details surrounding voting, because it really has been um, a topic of national discussion, Arizona's voting system over the last couple of years. So we'd really like to dispel some myths along the way also. So Stephen, welcome. Thank you so much. Were you catch up and she was mustard? Let's see. All right. I think I'm ready to rock now. Can you hear me okay? We can. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I was Yoshi. She was Peach from Mario and Mario Kart. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we, we fit together. Um, and then there was an open seat on the bus and it was your classic yellow school bus and it was on the way back from the hall with the 1l halloween party at university of chicago and there was a spot open and i sat down and probably started peppering her with lots of questions she probably thought i was weird but you know i think as with business even if you don't get it right at first if you're persistent and you work hard then things things can work out well so it, and it did well I love that it was a match, Peach and Yoshi. That's great. Um, we are going to pepper you with questions this morning because you have a lot of information to share with us. You carry the title of Maricopa County Recorder. It is an elected office throughout the entire county. What in the world does the recorder actually do? What is the job and role of the county recorder? Absolutely. So the Maricopa County Recorder, which I'm sure most of you dreamed of being when you were small children. So for the one of you who didn't, then I'll give you a little bit of background. The Maricopa County Recorder has three main statutory functions. It records public documents. So a lot of stuff related to real estate and our booming housing market and all the refinancings that people are doing. And then we have voter registration. We have 2.6 million registered voters in Maricopa County. That makes up about 62% of the voting population of Arizona, and we're the second largest voting jurisdiction in the United States. And then third, and as has been the topic of much discussion, both in Arizona, the entire country, and the entire world, is election administration in Maricopa County. And so I'm really grateful to be here today. I really appreciate ASBA's invitation. As mentioned, Small business is near and dear to my heart. I think it's what makes, uh, I'm still a believer that the business of America is business. And I just appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Hopefully this will be fun. Hopefully this will be lively. I'm glad I get to do it with Jen because she's somebody I've always looked up to as a, as a no-nonsense administrator who also keeps it fun. And so, um, yeah, hopefully we have, can have a good conversation. Terrific. We would love for the attendees, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, to go ahead and put those in the chat box. Emma will be helping us to make sure that we see those and have access to them. So um, please feel free to, to add questions to our lengthy list of questions. I feel like every time we turn around in Arizona, there is an election. I feel like I'm constantly getting election materials in the mail and that really like election season is always in play. But we have some pretty important elections coming up this fall. Tell us what they are and what we really can anticipate from a citizen perspective. It does seem that way, doesn't it? I'm a huge Suns fan. I'm a huge Diamondbacks fan. So I watch a lot of local sports and anyone who watches local TV, local news, local sports it has been already inundated with political commercials. And I think the reason why it feels like Arizona is in an omnipresent always going, never ceasing election cycle is because we're such a politically interesting state at this point, because we're a state that might tip the balance of power between Republicans and Democrats nationally. We're a state where you have a Republican governor, but you have a Democratic Secretary of State. You've had Republican U.S. Senators before, but now you have two U.S. Senators who are Democrats. And so a lot of eyes are on Maricopa County and in, on Arizona. And so we obviously had our presidential election in November 2020. We've had some municipal elections, including one in the town of Gilbert, where, where Jen obviously is uh, 
very familiar with. And we had a recent Tempe City Council election in March. We have a Litchfield Park one that's going on right now that's regarding a land sale. And then of course, we have the midterm statewide elections coming up and August 2nd is the primary for that. And November 8th is the general election. And on that ballot, we'll have governor, we'll have U.S. Senator Mark Kelly will be up, we'll have all of our U.S. House members, we'll have all of our state legislators, we'll have the Attorney General, Secretary of State. So, you know, uh, you know take a deep breath, because here we go again. Yeah, that's super interesting. Okay, so always in an election cycle, there's always going to be an election at some place, probably within the county, you guys are always in that um, sort of process but there are what we would call bigger elections where you have far more ballots going out um, and far more that need to be counted. Uh, so August 2nd, you said you threw out like so many different names of different elected offices that I always forget. And we have to remind ourselves that we operate sometimes in a little bubble and really sort of need to speak in plain, plain terms, right? Um, August 2nd, what will be on the actual ballot? That is a common uh, pitfall of those of us who are in <laughs> politics or in elections every single yeah. day. So yes, Jen's right to have a step back a little bit. So this is the primary election ballot in which the Republicans and the Democrats choose whom they want to put forward as their nominees for the November general election. Now, importantly, you can participate in this election, even if you're an independent or party not declared. You do have to take an extra step though. If you're an independent, you actually get to choose if you wanna participate in the Republican primary or in the Democratic primary. You either have to fill out this little postcard that should be in your mailbox in the next few days if you haven't received it already, or you have to go to request.maricopa dot vote. That's request.maricopa.vote. And we're going to send out an email after this event with a lot of links and some, uh, some of this information recapped. But so importantly, if you're a Republican, you get to vote in the Republican primary. If you're a Democrat, you get to vote in the Democratic primary. And if you're an independent party not declared, you get to choose which of those you want to participate in. That totally makes sense. Super helpful. And I think that that's a really good reminder that you don't have to be part of a party. You don't have to be declared to be part of a party to vote in a primary election. I think there, that is probably a myth out there um, that there would be no reason for an independent or a party not determined to vote in the primary election. But the reality is, is in some cases, uh, that vote will actually determine the outcome of the election because sometimes there is no opposing party that's actually running in, in the November uh, election. So very interesting. And I, I, I'm always fascinated by the way all of this works and also where the power lies. Um, the power lies in the hands of the voters. Can you just tell us a little bit, Stephen, about your philosophy when it comes to people and voting and the importance of that? Absolutely. It, it, Jen's absolutely right in that a lot of the positions are determined at the primary level. So I said just a little bit ago about how Arizona is such an interesting political state because our statewide elections are could go Republican, they could go Democratic. But when you talk about things like the state legislature or the United States House that are carved into individual districts, a lot of those districts, in fact, the vast majority of them are not competitive on a R versus D level. And so the person who ultimately takes that seat will likely be determined in the primary. And so, yeah, it is something that you maybe wanna pay attention to because your eventual representative could be determined at that level. And independents are actually now the largest voting block in Maricopa County. We have about 34% who are registered as independent, 33% registered as Republican, and about 32% who are registered as Democrats. And I know that didn't add up, that adds up a little bit short, but we have 1% libertarians out there as well. So, um, so, so yeah, our philosophy is we want to make sure that your vote is secure. We want to make sure your vote is safe. And if you want to participate in this election, which we certainly encourage, we wanna make it as accessible as possible. And there's a whole ways 
bunch of ways you can vote in Arizona. We wanna make you aware of those. We wanna make sure that you have access to those. I love that. Um, I'm, I'm equally passionate about ensuring that people have access to elections. Um, there is uh, a lot, I, I shouldn't say necessarily a lot. There, there are quite a bit of individuals out there who believe that they either can't vote or that they don't have you know, a proper ID or something else um, in order to vote. Do you have to show an ID to vote in Maricopa County and in Arizona? You have to show an ID when you first register and you have to attest to the fact that you are a United States citizen. Um, that is a prerequisite for being a registered voter. Then if you vote by mail, you have to sign the affidavit envelope and we compare that signature with your signature on your voter registration card and any other voter election related materials we have on file. If you show up in person, you do have to show a form of ID. Now, if you don't have access to your driver's license, there are other forms of identification that you can show that satisfy that requirement. But yes, if you show up in person, you do have to show ID. If you vote by mail, you do have to show ID when you first register to vote and you do have to sign that affidavit envelope. If you have questions or concerns about that though, we will, we will try and move mountains to make it possible for you to vote if you are a lawful registered voter, because we're really here to help. The only thing we ask is you, you take action sooner rather than later, because if you're just starting to think about this at 6.30 p.m. on election night, uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on. A lot of people are voting and, you know, we want to get you in before 7 p.m. But, you know, again, if you can think about it now, if you can start making your plans, if you can spread the word, then we'd really appreciate that. I like that. You mentioned some of the ways to vote in that. And I want to make sure that that message is loud and clear. You said you can mail in your ballot and you can go vote in person. What are we missing? Oh my goodness, you can do so many things in Arizona. Arizona is really a voter's buffet of options to, to vote. So you can vote, let's first talk about in person. You can vote in person at an election site starting 27 days before the August 2nd election. And so on locations.maricopa.vote, we will list the locations that are available and you can search by your location, whether it's work or your home, and you can see which are nearby. As the time progresses, we will open more and more election sites. But the wonderful thing about Maricopa County is that you can go to any of these locations. You don't have to just go to one assigned location as maybe was the case in the past. But even if you're living in Gilbert, but you're for whatever reason running errands in Buckeye, you can still go to a voting center at Buckeye, show your ID, you'll still get the right ballot printed because we'll pull up your voter registration profile and we'll print the appropriate ballot for you. Then you can vote by mail. So this is the way that most Arizonans choose to vote. 77% of Maricopa County registered voters are on the active early voting list, which means you'll automatically get mailed a ballot if you're a Republican or a Democrat for this primary, and if you're an independent who tells us which party you want to vote in. So with that, you have to take it out, you fill it out, you put it back in, you put it in the green envelope, you sign that green envelope, and then you can either mail it back through the traditional means of the United States Post Office, or you can go to a voting location and you can drop it off. You can even come to our downtown facility at Jackson Street and drop it off there. So lots of ways to vote. Um, you can track your vote. You can go to beballotready.vote, beballotready.vote. And you can make sure you see your ballot at all stages of the process. You can sign up for text message alerts. And again, we're gonna send some of this out on an email because I know this is a lot of information. But what I want you to know is that there are a lot of ways to vote. You can vote by mail, you can vote in person, you can get an early ballot and drop it off, and you can monitor that ballot through all stages of the process such that you know that we get it and that we process it. So there's a barcode, right? Is that how you guys are tracking it? There is a barcode. If you're an early voter, 
you get a ballot that has a special barcode on it, such that when you send that back, we scan it in so that we know we've received a packet from you. And that early barcode is associated with your voter ID profile. So no one else could just create a packet and you know try and sign your name on it and try and forge a ballot and send it back. And this also means that if you send back an early ballot and then you show up to a voting location, well, guess what? We're gonna already have scanned that and we're gonna say, hey, we already received an early ballot. You can vote a provisional ballot, but we already received an early ballot. Do you wanna do that? So that, that barcode is very important. It also allows us to know where is your ballot? When did it leave our facilities? How long is it gonna be until it gets to you? And then when you mail it back, where is it in the mailing stage? When it gets back to us, have we received it? Have we scanned it? Have we signature verified it? Once we've signature verified it, that's when we take the ballot out of the envelope and that's when your ballot becomes unknown to us such that we can't tie your votes back to you. That is a key component because there has been some, I think, confusion out there that, um, not because we can track where the ballot is and we can track it in the process. That also means you're tracking my vote, that you know how I voted uh, in the 2020 election. Is my ballot and my vote actually secure? Yes. I don't know how Jen voted. I will never know how Jen voted, you know, um, unless she chooses to tell me. I, I, I will never know how she <laughs> voted. Again, once so once we do all that verification of your identity, then a bipartisan team takes it out of the envelope, it gets put into an anonymous stack, and they go in stacks of 50 to the tabulation center. And we're dealing with 2.1 million votes, that tabulation ballot. So, you know, that would be like pulling a needle out of a haystack. Um, there are many, many, many different types of ballot styles. So depending on where you live, but uh, there's no way of tracing it back to the individual voter. So your, your, your choices are unknown to us. Yeah, so um, I'm glad somebody, uh, Heidi, put in the, the, the chat box for us a question about ballot harvesting. Um, can you give us a primer first, Stephen, on ballot harvesting? And I know that it was actually outlawed in Arizona a couple of years ago, maybe longer than that. Um, but can you tell us what it is and why it's illegal and what's being done uh, to ensure that that's not ha uh, still occurring in our state? Ballot harvesting is the unlawful act of collecting ballots from voters who are not part of your household or for whom you are a caretaker. So this is in the early voting context. If your family members all fill out an early ballot and they put it in that green envelope and they seal it and they sign it, you can take your family members' ballots to the post office box to the election center. But what you can't do is you can't go to your neighbor you can't go to your neighbor's neighbor. You can't go to the community five minutes down from you and start ringing everyone's doorbell and saying, hey, I'd like to take back your ballot. That's unlawful, that action. That's ballot harvesting. It's been unlawful in Arizona since 2016. Regarding ballot harvesting and the, and the reference film, so we only have one drop box in all of Maricopa County that is outside. All other drop boxes are in government facilities. The one that is outside is actually at our facility, at the MCTEC facility. It's under 24 seven video surveillance. Now, drop boxes largely just function as any USPS box would, any mail slot would, except for they don't have the intermediaries of the United States Post Office. So if you put your ballot in a drop box, instead of being picked up by the postman, that's actually going to be picked up directly by a bipartisan team of election workers, one Republican, one Democrat, who are gonna take that out. They're going to put tamper evidence, uh, plastic seals on the box. They're gonna write down the serial code numbers, and then they're going to take that and drop it off at our central count, um, central facility, 
those people are going to sign for it. They're going to write down the tamper evidence seal serial code numbers, make sure none of, the, no, none of those tamper evidence seals were broken, and then they're going to begin the ballot processing stage. Totally makes sense. And, um, you know, something we can all be aware of. I think uh, historically, in fact, I remember hearing this story probably in 2016 that there was, you know, an individual in a senior care facility that was sort of collecting everybody's ballots and dropping them off for them. Um, obviously, that is outlawed, that is not allowed. But if it is your family member in your same household, you can feel confident that it's okay to take their ballot and drop it off with yours. Is that what I'm Yes, you can do it for your own family members. And if you are in the position where you need assistance because you've been immobilized for whatever reason, please let the elections department know. We can send out a bar bipartisan team to retrieve your ballot together, Republican and Democratic member. And that way you don't have to get to a USPS box. That way you don't have to go into a voting center um, and it can still be done in a secure and lawful manner. Terrific, thanks. Hope that answered your question, Heidi. Populate it again if you need more info. Um, while you are the Maricopa County recorder, um, there are, I think, 13 counties in the entire state, if I remember correctly. Uh, and 15. so every county has, 15, sorry. Um, so every county has a county recorder. Is that true? Correct. Okay, and if that's the case, then is what you're outlining um, for us today, this is, covers the entire state. The job and role of the county recorder is equivalent in every county. So most, the vast majority of what we do is outlined by state law and by the elections procedures manual, which is written by the secretary of state based off of state statute. And it flushes it out in a little more color such that it's our our roadmap for administering elections. We can't deviate from state statute and we can't deviate from the elections procedures manual. Now, our processes, our people, some of our technology is maybe different than, you know, in other counties. For instance, our ballot tracking ability and our ballot tracking website is for Maricopa County alone. Um, but other counties have been developing you know, good processes as well. And that's a wonderful thing because we get together as county recorders, we share best practices. I think Maricopa County's standing uh, amongst the 15 counties is, is, is good, uh, but I also think very highly of the 14 other county recorders and, and their ability to get the job done. Uh, because we're Maricopa County, we have access to a, a few more resources and a few more um, technology advancements that I think we've been utilizing pretty well, but we also have the challenge of having, like I said, 62% of the voting population of Arizona is in Maricopa County, and as probably all you business owners know, you know, we're the fastest growing county in the United States, and every single day more and more people come here, which is wonderful, and it's an, a testament to the amazing business climate and living climate that Arizona has created, but it also means you know, that's a lot of new registered voters every single time. That's a lot of people that we have to familiarize with this voting system that has largely been in place since about 1992 in terms of no excuse mail voting, which Arizonans seem to really like. Yeah, okay, totally helpful. So basically what you're saying is most of the services, uh, most of what we're talking about really is uh, not specific to Maricopa County, and yet there are, you know, some differences based on scale. I get that. That totally makes sense to us. Um, right. Sometimes when we open up a ballot, we are shocked at how long they are, <laughs> particularly when judges are on the ballot. Will there be judges on the ballot? And if so, is there a place to go and find out if judges are people we should be voting for or, a, you know, a yes, that, or no, don't retain them? Yeah, that's a good question. And I know that there is a judicial score and there are also private organizations and you can contact your party and they often put out little cheat sheets as to who you should vote to retain or vote not to retain. Uh, the vast, vast majority of judges are retained typically. Yes, we will have a long ballot. 
um, we in Arizona, we like voting on stuff. And so a little bit of Arizona's history, Arizona became a state during the progressive age, which was a movement that wanted the maximum accountability for elected officials um, and officials in government as possible. And so they instituted the referendum process, the initiative process, that is a form of direct democracy such that we can vote on you know, tax initiatives or whether or not to make marijuana legal. And then we, can, we also get to vote on a whole bunch of positions, including yours truly, Maricopa County Recorder, which maybe you would think, mm, why is that an elected position? Heck, we have a mine inspector in the state of Arizona who will be on the ballot for 2022. That's an elected position that used to figure in more prominently in Arizona's landscape. So yeah, it will be a long ballot. Um, in 2020, we had over 60 contests on the average Maricopa County ballot. And uh, you know, it will it will still take a few minutes to figure out. I, I, I always encourage people to, you know, do a little digging before you step into the ballot box because if you're just showing up on election day, you might be surprised and there might be a lot of unfamiliar names. On that, uh, on that ballot. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. So helpful to, to know. Um, great question from Susan. Susan um, uh, talks a little bit in her question about a, a disability that makes it difficult to write her signature. I think this is translatable to, to a number of individuals who may have disabilities throughout our county. What accommodations and, and how are we making voting accessible for our uh, differently abled population? At every voting location, we do have assistive devices that are specially designed for those who are visually impaired, those who are, who are auditorily impaired, even have a, a sip and pop device, which is a unique device that allows people who have lost access to, to their limbs to, to be able to use that regarding your signature. So if you sign and your signature has materially changed and you send it back and it doesn't look like any of your past signatures. Now we capture an image of every single signature that you send back to us. So if your signature has evolved, then that's probably okay. If it has just all of a sudden materially changed, then that might flag cause us to flag that signature. And in that instance, what we will do is we will try very hard to contact you. We will call you, we will text message you, we will email you if you've written down your email address. And we will say, hey, Jane, I forget, Susan, it was Susan who asked the question. Susan, your, your signature doesn't match. We wanna make sure that is you. Can you provide some personal identifying information over the phone or over text or over the secure text message portal? Um, Make sure that's you. Did you vote that ballot? So in 2020, Maricopa County flagged about 24,000 signatures like that, that it was then able to cure by contacting the voters. And one of the things that we've developed recently that I'm proud of is just an ability to send out a text message that you can click on that sends you to a secure portal to make sure it is you so that we don't have to interrupt you at night while you're having dinner. We don't have to interrupt you while you're at work during the day. But one thing I wanna impress upon you is for all of these things, if you vote earlier, it helps us because it gives us more time to look at your signature, to contact you if there is an issue. That's um, super helpful insight. Uh, on that note, actually, uh, voting early, um, election night for, uh, I'll just say it, nerds like me and Steven are, it's like Christmas, but um, without uh, really knowing what's in the present. It's like you never know, and but it's always an exciting time and you anticipate voting night. I would imagine, Steven, uh, that you anticipate it more than most and prepare for it and probably don't sleep for quite some time. Um, in that vein, when you guys release the uh, initial set of numbers that usually happens right around 8 p.m. on voting night, polls closed at seven in most cases, uh, eight o'clock rolls around, we are anxiously waiting, refreshing our browsers over and over and over again. What are the numbers that we are seeing? Are those all the early ballots that you've collected? What is that number? So for the 2022 cycle, at 8 p.m. on August 2nd or November 8th, 
that initial number will be every single early ballot that we have received by Sunday before Tuesday election day. And the reason that is, is if we receive your ballot, say, on Monday, or if you drop it off on Tuesday and it's an early ballot, we still have to take that in. We still have to scan it, make sure it lines up with your voter registration profile. We still have to capture the signature on, on the affidavit envelope. We then have to make sure that that signature matches one on your file. We then have to send the ballot to a bipartisan processing board. They take the ballot out. They make sure that it's whole. They make sure it's not tear, torn. They make sure it's not damaged. And then it gets sent to tabulation. If you drop that off on Tuesday election day, that's not going to happen until Wednesday at the earliest. So at 8 p.m., it's going to be all early ballots that we receive by Sunday. Later that evening, we are going to report those people who voted in person and fed their ballots into a tabulation device at the location. So on election day, but election day or only, if you show up in person and you get a ballot printed, you can feed that ballot directly into a precinct-based tabulator. So a tabulator at the location. That location has, a, the tabulator has a device, a memory device inside of it that is secured, that is then at the end of the night taken out by a bipartisan team, put in a tamper-proof uh, bag, driven to our central facility, all the serial numbers are written down, it's then uploaded to the election management server, and those results are added to the total results, and then that device is um, securely discarded and never used again. Those results will start coming back around 9, 10, and as the further out locations come to Central Phoenix, and then we load them up. So that's 8 p.m. You're going to get early votes that we got by Sunday. Later that night, you're going to get people who voted in person and fed it into the tabulator. On Wednesday and Thursday, by Thursday, we'll have almost all of the ballots tabulated. Those are going to be people who dropped off an early ballot on Monday or Tuesday. Anything that comes after that time period is either going to be a ballot that was damaged, that was torn and we had to reproduce, or is going to be a voter who we're trying to reach out to and still confirm their identity because their signature didn't match up and they have five business days after Tuesday election day to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. And it is a long process and it has a lot of people, but it sounds like the way you're describing it, there is a chain of command for all of these ballots to ensure um, that nothing is being tampered with and that everything really is being um, securely transmitted uh, until we have those counts. And I think that yes. that probably gives uh, our business owners and our business employees and, and all of our citizens sort of great comfort. We're getting lots of questions in the chat. So thanks everybody for contributing because there are so many great things to know. Um, are you working closely with the Secretary of State to establish the polling places and have those locations been finalized yet? So to, uh, real quickly going to hit on the previous one. Yes, we have a chain of command for everything. If you want to see it in person, Jen and I are trying to describe it here, but if you want to see it in person, we want to show you. We're, we're, I'm proud of the steps that we've taken to improve this operation. I'm proud of where this operation is at. So we can always, if you want to do a tour, if you want to do an ASBA tour uh, of our voting facility, then, then we'd love to do that. Uh, regarding results, I realize that um, you know everyone wants the results faster. We hope to have a very high percentage of results tabulated within 24 hours. We hope to have, you know, if people vote early, then we'll have a lot of results on election night. I think people will vote early. So we're still working to speed up that process as much as possible, because I know, especially in these close races, we want as high a percentage as soon as possible. All right. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, are, am I working with the Secretary <laughs> of State? Uh, we work with the Secretary of State uh, primarily with the Elections Procedures Manual, uh, which is, again, that roadmap translating state statute into actionable items for election administrators, which are the 15 county recorders and election directors. And we also work with the Secretary of State on things like cybersecurity for the whole state 
things like communications for the whole state. Regarding voting locations, that's something that I work on with the Board of Supervisors, which is a five member elected panel here in Maricopa County. Uh, we are going to have approximately 210 to 225 voting locations in Maricopa County for the August primary. We have the vast majority of those, but if you ever want to serve as a voting location for, um, for Maricopa County in a future election, I'd love to talk with you. There's a few areas we'd still like to have a little bit of coverage on. We make our decisions on those voting locations largely through da data. Um, we have data on where people voted, when people voted um, from past elections, and we try and put voting locations where there's high densities, high concentrations of people who are voting. Now, obviously, patterns change over time, um, but that's the best information we have, and that's what we've been working with, just as your business probably makes data-driven decisions. The other things that we take into account is how is accessible is it from public transportation? How close is it to an interstate? And one thing that we're proud of is if for whatever reason, one location has a line, then you can go to that locations.maricopa.vote website and you can find another location that's just a few miles away and you can see the wait time for that one. So it's just sort of like, we're trying to make it like Disneyland where you can see the wait times for the different rides. And if Splash Mountain has a really long wait time, which hopefully we won't have, but then you can go to, um, oh shoot, what's another ride? I don't know, <laughs> but Space you can Mountain. go to another ride Space nearby. Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you make voting sound so fun, Stephen. So we're all we're all in on that. Um, that actually is a great segue to this question that we had from from one of our participants, and that is, do you need volunteers? Do you need poll workers? Uh, what's the process, and how can I sign up? <laughs> Heck yes! Please join us. We have to hire three thousand three hundred temporary workers for the August primary and the November general election. The Maricopa County Recorder's Office and Elections Department is a full-time staff of about 160 people. So we are a giant, we're a snake that swallows an animal and all of a sudden we just have to expand a whole ton. And so we're working really hard right now to recruit all those workers. They are paid positions, uh, though they're, they're temporary positions, but they're paid positions. So if you want to work at a voting location, if you want to work at our central count uh, facility, if you want to be part of warehousing, if you want to drive a truck, if you want to verify signatures, we want you. Uh, the website is getinvolved.maricopa.vote. Getinvolved.maricopa.vote. You can fill out your interest forms. There's a lot of different positions listed there for the temporary election positions. If you have a kid, if you have a high school senior who you want to get out of the house for the summer and you want to get the him or her uh, working, we'd love to we'd love to take that person. Um, if you're you know have a college student who you know has a free summer, we'd love to take that person. If you're somebody who is just interested in this process, there's no better way to understand elections than to work elections. And so we'd love to show you that. So get involved at maricopa.vote. Yes, thank you. That's great. And uh, thanks to, to any of you who are considering uh, helping on that front. I can uh, imagine it's no small task to get all that many people organized. Um, I'm going to get down to this next one. It's the voter and identification card, the VIC. Uh, one of our great participants today actually got one in the mail and they want to know if they can show that card to vote in person and then nothing else. Can they just show you that the, the the VIC card, the, the vote uh, voter identification card that you all send out and call it good? Uh, you, you need to take another form of ID with that. You can pair that with one. I can send around a handy chart of the different mixes of IDs that you can bring to a voting location that are sufficient. Again, your best bet, if you have it available, um, is, is a driver's license. I think that's the one that is by far the most commonly used and, um, and is sufficient by itself. Um, but I'm glad you got that because we did yeah. just have the redistricting process. And so all of your districts might have got changed because every 10 years, uh, the U.S. Census requires us to engage in a redistricting process. And so you might have a new state legislative district. You might have a new congressional district and other districts. And so those are all captured on that on that card that we are sending out. Great. Yeah. And I feel like there could be a whole nother uh, AZ Speaks 
just about redistricting. It's a complicated uh, process for sure, and one that uh, takes quite a bit of time and effort. So thank you. Um, how easy is it for somebody to vote in two different states? Uh, if somebody really does want to commit sort of voter fraud, you know, and I, and I would imagine, unfortunately, there are some people out there who who would want to do that. Um, how, how What are we doing to prevent it? Whether it's how do we really prevent ballot harvesting, uh, especially once all those ballots have been dropped in the box? How do we really prevent somebody from voting in two states? Um, how do we how do we make all of this happen? How do we make sure? Just got to turn my go? light back on here. <laughs> uh, come on, there we go. Um, okay, so yes, there are people who, as in all walks of life, there are people who are going to do some foolish things, some things that violate the law, and we've seen a few of them prosecuted even in recent weeks. So how do you make sure that nobody, somebody doesn't vote in multiple states? So being registered in multiple states, that in and of itself isn't a felony. Voting in multiple states is a felony. So we are part of the Eric cross-check system. Um, we compare our voting records after every major election with the voting records of other participant states. And if somebody pops up on both states, then we, one of us will coordinate which, uh, which state wants to send it to his or her attorney general. And then the attorney general will investigate and will prosecute. And it is a felony. And I just think that, you know, I, I would say to anyone who's even contemplating to this, one extra vote in a vote where there's going in a contest where there's going to be millions of ballots cast, you know, you should never commit a felony. But, you know, if you're going to commit a felony, like why, why would you run the risk of committing a felony and getting prosecuted for that and having that on your record for the rest of your life just to cast one more vote in a race of millions of votes? And so it, it, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. Um, another thing that we see happen and have referred to the attorney general's office is, you know, uh, we'll, we'll send out ballots to, you know, uh, let's say a husband and wife in a household. Um, and it happens that, um, you know, uh, the, the husband died two days before ballots went out. Um, we get that death record and, and we know that if that husband voted, then that, that couldn't have happened. And so, you know, somebody returned back the ballot. And so we refer that to the attorney general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it is unfortunate. It does happen. Uh, we, we do look for these things. It is always done in the post-election context. Um, and so we sweep up and we check those records after, after the election and we do send them to the attorney general's office. And I think he actually has a list of ongoing investigations right now. Yeah, we have about six minutes left for questions, and I probably have like eight more. So we're going to go really fast. Right. Um, if you don't, okay, I'll answer this. more quickly. Do we have a community outreach contact from the recorder's office that can go work with businesses and provide additional education? Yes, we'd love to partner with your business. We would love to do that. We can do voter registration training. We can do election seminars, anything you want. We'll send out an email. You can email me even. Uh, we'll, we'll send out an email after this, uh, but it's ihaber at risc.maricopa.gov. That's kind of hard to remember, so we'll send that out afterwards. We'd love to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, somebody uh, said they'd rather have accurate counts versus done quickly. Um, I want both, just to be really clear. I want accurate and quick. Um, but will there be bi bipartisan observers, including independents and libertarians that are allowed to participate? And how is that process observed? Yes. So in the hierarchy of our, our priorities, uh, accuracy is first and foremost. Um, so before every election, we do a uh, logic and accuracy test to make sure the tabulation machines are working properly. This means we take a stack of 8,000 ballots that have been marked in a manner that we already know the results of. We feed it through the tabulation machine. We make sure that it's reading the ballots properly. Um, we do that after the election too, to make sure that it didn't get somehow disrupted during the election process. Additionally, the political parties do a hand count audit um, so they sit in groups of three, and they have to be bipartisan, and they go through and they hand count a random selection selected by the political parties themselves 
of votes in the election. So in 2020, there were 47,000 votes that were hand counted by bipartisan teams of political parties, and they matched the, the tabulation read 100%. So there are lots of things, and that's just regarding the tabulation equipment. Again, we have layers and layers and layers of security. That is so important to us. Uh, we have you know, spent a lot of time and effort on making our tabulation room as secure as possible, different access codes for everything, uh, clear glass walls, everything, all the wires are exposed so you can see exactly where they run. And if you have questions on this, that is something we can talk to you about until the cows come home, or you can come down to our facility and see. Yeah, it's really fascinating to, to um, be the observer, I think. Um, I've never done it in person, but to ha see the cameras that are on and to be watching uh, the vote count is, is really, really interesting. A um, few more questions. We're going to do this really fast. Do you remember Sharpie Gate when there were Sharpies at voting places? And um, it's my understanding, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'd, I'd love for you to correct me, but Sharpies are actually an acceptable form of marking your ballot, is that right? And if so, um, you know, what, what should we and shouldn't we be using to mark our ballots? Yeah, so in 2020, Sharpies were actually the preferred form if you were voting on election day. So as I mentioned, on election day is the only day where you could feed it into the tabulator. And the Sharpie ink actually dried faster so that it wouldn't leave a residue on the tabulator and gunk up the tabulator. That being said, moving forward, we, we found a different marking device for election day that's not a Sharpie, that doesn't cause as much bleed through, and we're using a thicker stock of paper such as there's less bleed through. Um, that didn't cause any disruptions in the tabulation process in 2020, but nonetheless, because you know perception be can become realities, we're improving that process. For your purposes, if you are voting early, you can use any blue or black marking device, any blue or black pen. Um, if you're voting on election day, you'll be given a, a, a special type of pen that won't be a Sharpie, uh, that won't cause uh, as much bleed through, but uh, will still dry in time to be fed directly into the tabulator. There was a question about voter initiatives, but um, it is a little outside of the scope of what the county recorder does since you don't actually oversee voter initiatives that obviously you're counting the votes um, for voter initiatives, but that process is really through the Secretary of State's office and those laws are created by the legislature, correct? Correct. The only role that we play in that is for voter initiatives have to get a whole bunch of signatures to appear on the ballot. The Secretary of State is the filing officer for that, but she will send signatures that have to be confirmed um, by Maricopa County for those signatures that are in Maricopa County. We have to confirm those signatures that they were valid petition signers such that they can qualify for the ballot. I have my opinions on, on, on some of the initiatives just like you do, uh, but at the Maricopa County Recorder's Office, we just tabulate the, the results and I can be pleased or disappointed just like every other voter. Yep, and uh, it is interesting, even when your name's on in the ballot, sometimes you're disappointed and sometimes you're pleased and it, it, it happens. All right, rapid fire here. Will the county recorder be on the ballot this year? I know the answer, but what's the answer? Uh, no, no, thank goodness. We've got enough stuff going on. Uh, it, it's been an absolute blast the first year and a half. Uh, and unfortunately, I get until 24. So four-year terms for county recorder, you were elected in 2020, put into office in 2021, which will extend your uh, tenure to January of 2025. So 2024 right. will be the next time Maricopa County recorder is on the ballot. Um, how and what type of process do you go through to clear voter rolls when people have moved or died? How are you purging those rolls? Uh, the voter, uh, what we, it has a new name. It used to be called the permanent early voting list, but now it's called uh, the active voting list. Is that correct? Yes, the active early voting list. So great time for that question because we're going through it right now. We're going through an important process. I told you we're sending out all those voter ID cards. We're also sending out 90-day notices that we have to send to everyone who's on the active early voting list before a statewide election. We're getting back anyone who marks it as the person no longer lives here, my address has been, uh, has been, needs to be updated, or this is undeliverable. So we take back all of that mail. We're really a mail house these days, and we input it into our system such that, you know, if the 90-day notice went out and that person said, nope, you know, college kid isn't here anymore, uh, we can then put that into our system so, so we don't send out a ballot for the August primary. But 
we need your help on that. So don't just take it if your college, your kid has gone away to college and doesn't vote in Arizona anymore, uh, doesn't want to vote in Arizona anymore. Don't just take it and shred it. You either check that box at the top that says has moved away or send back a note or something so that we know. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Um, and again, your role is really defined by state statute. And so how you administer also um, falls into all the other 14 counties uh, in addition to Maricopa County. So 15 total counties, but these, these rules, if you will, uh, chain of command on ballots, the, you know, the prohibition on um, you know, voting uh, on behalf of your deceased family member, all of these things are very much um, cookie cutter, if you will, in from, from county to county, meaning all of those regulations apply, correct? Correct. And, and to that last point about when we can take somebody off the voter registration rules, when we can move them to inactive status, that's also defined by state law and by federal law, such that, you know, if I just decided, well, you know, uh, anyone who hasn't emailed me recently needs to be taken off of the voter registration list. I, I, I can't do that. I can only do that under very specifically laid out statute, uh, statutes that are actually federal law that says, well, we've received X number of pieces for as undeliverable mail. Yeah, super helpful. Really good insight. Um, I think we'll end on this final final question for you, Stephen, and sort of let you make some a, a closing comment with this. And, and that really is, um, why does it matter to our businesses? Why does it matter to our employees? Why does it matter to our citizens uh, that voting is safe, secure, and accessible? When when Americans are asked about what makes America unique, one of the things that they most frequently point to is our history and legacy of democracy. And more than any other country in the world, we've had an uninterrupted successful run at democracy. And I think that the vast, vast majority of Americans still fundamentally believe that while it's maybe not a perfect form of government, it is the best form of government. And it has allowed us to be successful in uh, I mean, the most successful country in the history of the world. Um, and so that's something that I'm very proud of. It is an institution that we should continue to respect. And it's an institution that only works if, you know, we have a safe, secure, accessible, transparent election process that people believe in. And so it's really my job to make sure all that happens, but then also convey to you why it is the way it is and such that you can feel comfortable about it. And uh, such that, you know, place like, and why elections matter? Well, you know, there's a, I think there's a reason why Arizona, people are moving to Arizona in droves. And I think there's a reason why people want to be in the United States in droves. And, you know, maybe some of it has to do with lots of other things, but a little bit of it has to do with politics. And I, I think we're, we're doing a good job as a country and as a state. And I hope we continue to be a country and a state where people want to move and people want to do business. And hopefully they'll do business with your business. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thanks for your time today, for your level of expertise. And more importantly, you might get to be the spokesperson, but I know there are 165 full-time employees standing behind you, uh, not literally, obviously, um, but all supporting your effort and your work. And, um, you know, I just, uh, and, and really to the benefit of every single voter, uh, both in Maricopa County, but in every county in Arizona and how important uh, their work is, along with the uh, thousands and thousands of temporary workers that jump in to help too. So please extend our gratitude to all of them. Uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. And I love how accessible your office is and how willing uh, you are to share and open up the voter box and help us all see uh, really what's behind it. So thank you. Um, we will be sending out a briefing that you guys will have all of the information, including the many websites that, that uh, uh, recorder Richard shared with us today. Um, I hope that this was beneficial and informative. Uh, please know that you are welcome to contact any of us, both at ASPA and at the county recorder's office for additional information. Uh, I'm proud of, of the, the work that ASPA does and so grateful to be associated with them. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you.